Ron founded Nelms Surveying in 1992, serves as the principal. He is licensed in California, Arizona, and Nevada. He's a past president 2018 of the CLSA, California Land Surveyors Association. He's a CLSA member of the year in 2015. During his time at Nelms, he has performed countless surveys that include boundary resolution, topographic surveys, as-built surveys, and ALTA standard surveys. In addition, he is noted to be his for his expert tetanus testimony in the courtroom. He is also the author of Putting Big Sticks by Little Sticks. And if you guys want to uh, check out uh, Ron's uh, podcast on the geoholics, he goes into in depth about the book as well. So that's a, it was a good, good conversation there. He's been gifted with four grandchildren for recreation. He likes to play tennis and pickleball and enjoys reading and writing in his spare time. So Ron, uh, Ron's going to be on a few times over the next uh, couple months. And uh, the, this is a kind of the start of a bunch of boundary related ones that we have coming up um, with uh, Ron and uh, John Stahl as well. So I uh, appreciate your time as jumping on here, Ron. And I think it, it's also going to be kind of a, I put in the uh, follow-up email this week on uh, Wisdom Wednesdays is about uh, using historical evidence, chapter nine. So um, this might all play well in together this week. So this is fantastic. I love looking forward to the conversation. All right. Well, thanks, Trent, for letting thanks, me Ron. come on. You can hear me okay now? Or, all right. You are good to go. All right. Well, thanks for letting me come on, Trent. Uh, I think what you're doing with Mentoring Mondays and the Geoholics and Wednesdays, I yeah. mean, that's just, uh, in my day, I, uh, it would have been remarkable to do what you're doing. So yeah. kudos to what you're doing. And I just, I admire you. I heard Aaron Smith say, few weeks ago that yeah. you were his hero well you're my hero too yeah, so now that it. i buttered you up you know <laughs> Thank you, i love it well mm. i i'm i'm forgive me i'm a little uh what's the word i want to say tipsy but i was on i had the opportunity of staying on a boat out on uh out off of uh the bay of and off of uh, what's that san pedro what's that island out there i forgot the name of it but um, and anyway, so I'm a little bit still kind of see thing. I'm walking around and I, I still haven't got rid of it because I'm a land lover living in, in Bakersfield. And, uh, so I, uh, it's, it stayed there. I got used to the ocean and sleeping on a, on a boat. So I'm still kind of rotating. Um, and I, I, looked at i told talked to trent about this a little bit or i sent him off and actually i talked to rob mcmillan and says you know i'm seeing a lot of things that are going on in our society into our survey profession that's a lot of just measurements and and uh, coordinate values and sometimes i think we need to get back to true boundary retracement uh, my background is predominantly boundary retracement i love doing it I, and I work basically in the Kern County area of Bakersfield. And uh, I look and I love to read. I read all the time. It's, it's almost to a fault. And uh, these three books that you see in front of you is, I think that those are probably the foremost authority on boundaries. They're, so what I'm gonna do is I wanna talk a little bit about using some of these books um, in some sort of in some of my boundary retracement of what I did. Um, so, but there's other books out there that are I, I that's those three are my library and some other books that I re highly recommend that you have in in it. And there's you guys may have some others too that you may want to to plug in there and say, hey, these are excellent books to go to. But you'll see, I'm just no particular order or preference or anything like that that I decided to put in my um, in my library. And I think every surveyor should have an adequate library of uh, boundary resolutions. You'll see, all the, uh, you'll see down here, you'll see Surveying the Land by Milton Denny and Forensics of Wilson's books and the Pincushion by Jeff Lucas. Uh, and then river and lake boundaries, I think is important, even though I don't have a lot of rivers and lakes in current, where I practice that, I thought, well, at least I have it in my library. And, and so I know a little bit about it. Uh, the last book is, is kind of an off, uh, you wouldn't think it'd be there, but I, I recommend it. It's neighborhood laws, fences, trees, and boundaries. It's not, it's for, for kind of a uh, dummy's guide to boundaries and fences and it's mainly meant for the landowner but it's 
it has some good valuable information in there that you could use as far as, and I think Mr. Stahl is going to talk about this lay, uh, later about how to conflict re resolutions. So it has a lot of little little nuances in there. Um, you take it, leave it, you know, it's just something to have in all these books to have in, in, in a library, in your library. I want to, I, I don't like just talking through everything. I, there's a lot of, uh, let's kind of scan through the people who are on there, uh, on this, uh, listening here and you, many of you, I respect and your authority and what you, you do in the, as a surveyor. So if there's questions or interactions, if I say something that's not correct or you think, or to clarify it, please, please speak up and ask the questions. But I put this up here to say, well, what consideration should you use when you're doing boundary resolutions and, and coming or retracement? And and this is more of a question and I'm, I'm looking for answers here. So how weighted do we do the budget? Is it, we got a killer uh, boundary uh, retracement. How does budget fit into that? Um, and the second question, how much do we put in a coordinate value in our measurements? Do we, do we put a lot of emphasis on it? And how much of it should we? And is mathematical analysis important? Uh, have we considered case law? Um, and do we, what kind of resources do we use as we're doing boundary retracement? Um, pedigree of the monuments, uh, how important is that? And then chain of title. So I guess it's more of a question to this, this group. Any, so I'm open it, I would like to open it up a little bit and have a little discussion before we get into, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show about three or four different cases, if you will, or, or uh, survey uh, where I ran into that I was able to, to go back to these books, uh, revisiting Brown and Clark, and pull those up to, to help me with my determination. One of them is a, a, a court case. But before I do, I'd like to have a little discussion, a little bit of see where everybody is at about these, maybe form it these questions, or if there's anything else that you might want to comment about. So Mr. Schroeder has his hands up and I would imagine in his career, number one was not a, uh, not a factor. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, well, thanks, Rob. Uh, I guess I'm gonna pick on number two because I uh, put a lot of time in a presentation I did at the seven state conference. When was that Trent, year before last? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's not how good you can measure, but knowing what to measure, but using coordinates for reference information when you have an existent monument and then replacing it with with the ability to repeat yourself and uh, having all the facts and my last 12 years ron for your background i was a cadastral chief for blm in alaska um you know the man and i and i work with bob bell and, and and a whole host of others in writing the 2009 manual which for the first time they put in you know the ability to use coordinates with caveats of you know having the ability to get in the footsteps of the person that was providing the coordinates you know be able to get on their data so you know i think that's a valuable tool but it's also a very misused tool that you just can't you know compute something up and go to coordinates and not look for that original evidence of the corner so um you know, I give weight when I have an existing corner and I have a good coordinate that I can repeat to a known datum. You know, I, I don't think the corner can ever really be lost unless somehow we lose the ability to get to whatever realization of datums that are in the future. But <clears throat> we've had Dave Doyle on here too. And, you know, NGS now is with their transformations and their you know, update for custom motion. You really, I think we have a new age with the ability to use coordinates as a tool for reference once you have the, the physical evidence and the monument there. So I guess to answer your question, I think that really, really depends, you know, certainly, um, you know, you have to investigate that and do your due diligence and uh, you can't ignore it though. Say if somebody put an opus 
on a, an existing section corner and pictures were there and the monuments that is existent and the big yellow caterpillar took it out. Uh, I don't think you can walk away from that's valuable uh, evidence. So I'll just shut up there. <laughs> Go for it, George. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll chime in on, on number one. That's probably the hardest part to determine on a boundary survey or retracement. And it's usually the last place I go after considering the other items on this list and gathering all the information I can from every resource available. And the unfortunate part about that is you spend probably, well, maybe a third as much time gathering all the information and doing the research to put together a, a confident proposal for a boundary, even if you end up saying it's going to be time and material. Uh, as, as you do doing the doggone survey a lot of times. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Anybody else? Okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I hate to be a hog. For it, for it, I'll, I'll just have to tell you a story because it was so cool. So I'm in I'm in uh, University of Alaska surveying program in 1973, and we had Walt Rovelar actually come to our college class because he's going to speak at the surveying conference. And he showed us these pictures that he's digging these 14-foot poles in Georgia looking for section corners and everybody shaking and says well how far do you go I mean how, how can you put a budget on that you know he was you know for was a forest service or what work for whatever with and the federal government with BLM is the same way it's like there is no budget as far as doing it right but in the private sector so I was private sector for 30 years yeah it, it comes to play it's like how far can you go? Can you charge this poor client when you say you got to break down? You know, it's going to be a so simple, eloquent part breakdown, and suddenly you're outside the quarter section and the section, and you're you know all around the township to get evidence. That's a hard. It's it's a hard ethical one. I I agree with George. I it it puts a lot of pressure on people. You know, can have I done everything I can do to get the evidence to make the survey right versus I have a budget, even if it's TNM, you just feel guilty that, you know, you, it's just communication. You got to talk with the client, but it's, I've been there. It's, it's really hard. <laughs> Go for it, Ben. Uh, a couple comments. Uh, first of all, like what was mentioned about NGS and their ability to track coordinates now, and they're moving away from passive monuments to control that, uh, I, I think we can use coordinates as a reference frame for those surveys if they were tied to those coordinates before, and we should. It's, an, it's a verifiable uh, measurement that if documented correctly, I think should have weight just like the monument does if the monument's not there. All these considerations really bring us back to where is the monument, because that's where the property line is, and who set the monument first, and the parent rights, and getting back to that, and mathematical analysis comes into play when you consider, you know, how you're gathering the information and balancing out any human error in our measurement. And we're pretty good at measurement now, but we still have error in it. So we need to balance that error so that we can be confident in uh, our mathematical analysis. All, all going back to budget to where for a landowner or a uh, agency who is an owner for property, budget is an expectation of value. And so if we can gauge expectation with the owners, that they realize the value of the legal determination that we provide, then that helps set expectations for the budget that it costs. And if they want a quality legal determination and that quality legal determination that will hold up in court, then the budget should reflect that uh, level of effort. Okay. What do you think I got? One more, uh, if I could take one more, is that George? Yep, go for it, George. George, George. Okay. 
Uh, speaking of value, that is a very, very important thing. And very, very few of us surveyors actually, I think, appreciate the value of the service we provide. And we've historically, here I go again on my little bandwagon, but we have a hard time charging for that value. Uh, we, we tend to uh, break things down into hours and time spent rather than actually considering the value of the service, which is really important. I, I see Armand. I, got, I can't let, I can't no. bypass Armand. I mean, he's, I, he's, he's my hero too. <laughs> I was thinking the same. <laughs> hey, Ron, how's it going? Good. So just a quick one with budget. The biggest thing with budget is communication with the client, letting them know what to expect. And uh, I'm going to, you know, also experience with the area that you're working in, who's done other surveys in the area, what have they found, um, and that kind of information during your research. But if, if you got to be realistic with your, with your client, you know, if they had a lot that was maybe surveyed, or the corners were set in the 50s, and I says, if you got a lot of vegetation, we're probably going to have to go in your neighbor's backyard. Are you getting along with your neighbor? And it's those kind of questions, because this is an estimate, and it could take us, if we've got to dig down and cut out your bird of paradise, that giant bird of paradise, to find a corner, it may take us an hour or so, and that I says, time is money. Yeah. So just my little tidbit on budget yeah Good point. well i'm going to go to the next slide and, and this one here with the next three slides you'll see are some uh basics and there's no right or wrong answers to those questions that i ask it's just it's very subjective just to get a few just get some conversation going and some thought of where we're heading to um I'm not going to read these per se, but I'm just going to highlight real quick on Clark I, I, and, and the, the section it's in. But the basic thing is it's saying that follow in the footsteps of the original surveyor. Uh, in this application, the rule, the surveyor must realize that the primary duty is the identification of property rights. And we hear that all the time, follow in the footsteps. Um, once the dividing line between two land parcels is located in original survey, it remains fixed and unalterable. These are, I'm gonna talk about a few situations that we ran into where this, these sections will apply. Uh, the question is the true and correct boundary is not where a new and accurate survey would locate it, but where the retracing surveyor actually found it. And uh, determining what the true intent of the original surveyor, retracing surveyor must recover and examine the evidence that's left of the original survey. Uh, section 12.1 of evidence and procedure. Now I got the sixth edition. Now, Trent, I know that there's a seventh edition. I haven't got it yet, so I got to quote it out of six for now. Um, an original survey does not identify boundaries. It creates a very important it doesn't identify, but it creates. Principle three, a monument is set by the original surveyor and called for by the conveyance has no error in position. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you something later, hopefully if we get to it, of where this apply, could apply. It is legally correct and that is only the description may be an error. Off, out of Brown's, we find in principle nine, once a lot of street or block line is established, the by the original survey the land is in accordance with the original plat the lines are originally marked and surveyed are unalterable except by resubdivision principle 12 original monument set on the ground except where the intent is clearly otherwise control facts get on a plat principle 14 when a subdivision distance direction area presume subordinate to the intent of the subdivider the lines are marked and surveyed in the original positions, original monument control. And then it goes about the excess and deficiencies. The same with principle 24. So I'm gonna give a, a little application of, of a pro, uh, project I was involved with. It did not go to any court or case or anything like that, but it's just something that, uh, I, just a situation that I ran into. And, not to embarrass anybody or anything like that, but this is a, I just uh, drew, 
to keep everything kind of a little bit con uh, under confidential, I gutted out the part, the track map and just give you the basic of what the subdivision looked like. This is over here, it's a little proportioned out, but this is a mile from the north quarter to the south quarter, uh, actually. And then, and then this is a subdivision. So this subdivision is about a mile and a half wide from, from the west line over to the east line. It's about, a, you get a little, bit, a little over a mile, mile and a half. What happened was, is um, the HOA of this particular subdivision, it's a mountain community, um, it had the maintenance of all these roads where well, they were dirt. And so through the years, because of snow and rain, they would grade them out and through the not and well-meaning people eventually graded out all the centerline monuments. So they're gone. Then the front, but they would have surveys come in and the front lot corners would be missing and they wanted it. So they would run from the back lot lines and you see all of these the original subdivision says there were all two inch iron pipes all the way around the subdivision on the back lots. The surveyors would come in and, and move and put, uh, use the back lot lines to establish the front. Well, when the HOA got tired of, of riding on dirt roads, they elected to put it in the county's road system. Well, of course, the county says you got to build paving, you got to do it to our sections, you got to do it to our details. And one of those was setting monument encasements. Um, so they, they just had to do the monument encasements. So they, the HOA hired a surveyor to put those in. The surveyor uh, and it, it used the south quarter and the north quarter as a, as if you will, kind of a baseline backside then traverse through and set all basically well, through, through coordinate systems, actually through a GPS is by setting coordinates on each of these centerline monuments and then setting them that way. Noting the front lock corners and how they fit. Some of them were fitting off the center of the road to the right of ways, uh, you know, half a foot, three, you know, three quarters, a couple of tenths. So a, kind of a best fit scenario. Well, I get a call from this owner of lot 83. Now, if, if, you're, if you're paying attention, the north arrows kind of turned around a little bit, but, but just to give for the gist of the conversation, I get a call from the owner of lot 83 and said, they're taking two and a half feet of my property. So I, I said, what went out and we, what we found that the surveyor, not the surveyor who did the set, set the monuments in the middle of the street, but a surveyor 15, 10 years ago had done a sur the survey for the owner of lot 83 and set the corners from the two back pipes. And okay, somewhat that's acceptable because there's the front lot corners weren't in. So he set the line from there, turned an angle and set them, I guess. And then, then came back and she got a call by, he got a call, the same surveyor got a call for, for to do lot 82 because they're going to put a home in there. But the, instead of using his previous survey, he used the new centerline monuments and found that the property line, quote unquote, moved two and a half feet. Well, at that point, we I called. I said, "Well, what's going on?" And what happened? What's going? And did some research. Well, my what I ended up saying is uh, introducing and working with the county surveyor and the surveyor who did the subdivision. I'll go back. Who did the sub or did the centerline monuments for the track? Said you did. You should have weighed in the two inch iron pipes from the back you should have used those as your original because you go back to the principles and you go back to the principles that we talked about in the, in, from Brown and Clark, you, the line's inalterable. You can't move it just because the center line monuments move. You, you think they move, they moved whatever they did and you're now using these. So, but they, so instead of coming back here and weighing in all these pipes and then weighing it and weighing in the, the reestablish the center line, the, the surveyor didn't do that. But we were able to 
finally work a solution and the the surveyor who did 82 and 83 backed up and says yeah i should have stayed where i was originally and got things got resolved and our the owner of lot 83 was happy and we're starting to move along however all these lots back in this subdivision are going to rely on this centerline monument so what do you do um, this is a case like i said that's unalterable you move the lines it's it's a case that that the, instead of weighing these in, it was a coordinate system by using a site from half a mile, uh, about a mile away. And of course they got off two and a half feet or didn't match the, these other surveys. So the county surveyor and the other surveyor who did that sub set those centerline monuments, they, deter they decided to use the centerline monuments and say on his map, these monuments, this, the monuments in the center of the street were not for boundary retracement. It, it, they'll be used to show the center line of the improvements. So that's where we sit today. Uh, but my, my take on this is that you should have been weighing in the sec, the pipes in the back of the, in the back of the subdivision. So any, any questions on that? Any, did I make that, any questions on this, on this case here? I see Mike Schroeder's yeah. got a hand up. Yeah, so I just weigh in on, on your other slides. I agree with everything about, you know, the original monuments, but the caveat would be if determined undisturbed. Because, I mean, I, I could tell you a whole bunch of war stories about landowners and others moving monuments. Mm -hmm. So it's really, you know, you have to make sure that even though you've got a monument that's original in character, it hasn't been altered. It hasn't been moved. Oh, it fell in the riverbank. So I picked it up down there and I just put it in myself. Yeah. Once you got the testimony from that landowner, because you see us all out of whack. So mm -hmm. um, that's just a heads up for the young surveyors. Always take a look and say, does this look like original setting? Is there any ground disturbance around here? Uh, you know, if the mathematics say this thing really doesn't fit and I'm going to put my whole house of cards on it do a little bit more looking into, you know, is go back to where the math says and is there evidence of where that corner was? I mean, I found them under buildings, guys build houses or improvements and realize they're over the line, they move the monument. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's happened over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Before I before I go to Anthony, on that same uh, thing, Schroeder, we, we just came across one where the uh, kind of a, a rogue property owner decided to move a BLM cap and they had set the caps back in like 2012, hadn't approved the BLM plat yet. Um, BLM surveyors went back out there to just kind of verify things were still in the ground before they actually filed the map. And the guy had moved the uh, BLM monument like 26 feet, but he didn't move the magnet. And so they found the original magnet because again, going back to the mathematics, right? And they're like, that is not where we put it. <laughs> when I, found when the I, magnet because he didn't move the magnet. What, so When I was the uh, first Indian land surveyor for BLM in Alaska, and I went out to all these real regional realty people and, and I brought them down to our our museum in the federal building and I showed them magnets. I says, we know when people move monuments, we yeah. have our magnets. <laughs> there you they, go. Exactly. They, they thought that was very empowering. I love it. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll also showed them a satellite and he says, I can tell when you move it. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Anthony, go for it. Yeah, um, my, my question would be that uh, I guess you, you find a lot of the subdivisions, most surveyors will set the rear corners. They won't set the fronts until later, until after the roads and stuff were built. Then they come in, they usually run a whole brand new control, whether they balance it or not. But I find a lot of the front corners are, they're not where they're supposed to be because they ran new control. Um, what is your suggestion on how to handle that? Do you hold the set rods that they set? And what happens is they kind of, rack the lot instead of maybe it being square or do you just call out those rods and hold flat corners uh, I'm, it's kind of like what you're talking about here but they're actual corners and not center line monuments i guess it, 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 is there a, a question on that anthony i'm not quite sure that well, I, 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 I guess my question is how, how would you handle that if, if you if the rear corners are probably original 
-hmm. Front corners are usually probably going to be set after the plat has been recorded. Mm -hmm. So then when you come in and you locate the front corners and find that the front corners are making a racking of the lot, you know, say the front corners are supposed to be 90, but you know, they're, they're not quite 90 there. Um, do, you, do you still hold those front corners or do you, I'm not sure what to do with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know if there's a true answer for it myself. Um, in this case, the I would go back to Clark and the principles that the it, it talks. One of the slides I can go back to. I can't remember what it was, but the original monuments. You, the retracement should be done by the original monuments. So if the set the front lot corners in this case, that's what happened is the front lot corners were set by various surveyors and they're not the original. Uh, and they they did they weren't too, some, most of the ones I looked at I didn't look at the whole subdivisions but the rest of them looked like their technique was correct and what they did but the, the if there's a controversy it, it's it, the books would say the original monuments is what you got to go back you're trying to retrace the original so but then you don't want to get into some pin cushion effect either. So <laughs> how, you know, yeah. how long has it been there? Is it acceptable? You know, all that kind of stuff. So I uh, see George has a hand up. In, in that case, if, if I ran into that situation, uh, what I would, the first thing I would do is I would be getting after that original plat surveyor and asking him what's going on because the scenario is correct. Usually the fronts are set after after most of the development work is done and if if there's a conflict between his fronts and backs he's got an issue he needs to straighten out just like with these center line monuments it would be the same issue if they're if they're not fitting together with the boundary of the subdivision for some reason or back lot corners for some reason uh that's his problem to solve and he needs to come up with a with some kind of a solution assuming he's still alive yeah. Now, in this case, he's not. It was uh, done in the '70s, so they, they, the subdivision was, and so there was not even consideration of e. I mean, there was considerations EDM, but it wasn't affordable for the survey. These were all done with transit and chains, so you know, every everything. The ones that we checked seemed to, you know, measurement wise, were fitting pretty good within, uh, you know, a couple of tenths, three tenths, something like that. So they did the best they could. So. Yeah, uh, I see Mr. Wing has his hand up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, this is a this is an issue that we deal with quite a bit. And, uh, you know, in the older neighborhoods, some of the areas that we work in there, uh, the subdivisions are irrigated. So a lot of them have a bubbler in the back and they flood irrigate the whole yard. So each lot line has to have a big berm. Right. So. The great thing about that berm is that it preserves those corners because nobody can really build a wall all the way up, you know, to the sidewalk or back of curb. And so it preserves these, you know, these original pins, but the backs, you know, the backs are always, and I, and I get what you're saying. I mean, I've had monuments that, that were off, you know, feet before centerline monuments. Um, but I've also seen the way that the, you know, the contractor set some of these centerline monuments after the surveyor will set straddles and they'll come in and you know i understand how that goes so i've always relied on the fronts like you're saying but the backs for us are always an issue because the walls you know the walls that are built are never square with the fronts and you know you have an alley in the back and sometimes the walls pushed all the way back you know right to that line sometimes it's maybe it's a half foot back but then you've got that concrete footer right there at the wall so you know in our experience, finding those back pins is, you know, 90%, you're not going to find anything. And 50% of that 90%, that wall is going to be on one side or the other. And um, now the, you know, I usually leave it up to the, the contractor to, you know, kind of have that relationship with, with the neighbor, because most of the stuff that we're doing, it's a demo, right? So they're, they're trying to be nice. They're trying to work with the neighbor. And that's a huge, you know, issue is on if that wall is a, you know, a stone wall or if it's just, a, you know, uh, a stick wall or a chain link fence that's, that's, you know, doesn't really have. So, I mean, a lot of these issues that I've seen are usually handled 
on a personal level and you know we only have the fronts to stand on because those backs have been you know wiped out when they built the walls and so it's always it's always an issue but like i said you know our job is to present the evidence show it record show what we found and then kind of let you know to kind of let them do some of the battling on that end but it's kind of our our take on it yeah good armin yeah, I'm listening to this scenario and, and the setting of the back corners always happens first and the setting of the front corners is at the end of the end of the project, but those are all original monuments. Unless you can prove they've been disturbed, um, you've got to hold them. Mm -hmm. Well, let me go on to case number two. This is my, uh, my, one of my favorites to discuss is um, this, I was involved in a, I, I think the dream case, you know, for, for, I mean, I think this is what we all the surveyors live for. I, I was in a hundred, I had 160 hours put in as an expert, not really said any boots on the ground, not did any measurements, complete uh, analysis and analyzing what was right. 160 hours of my time, six, and then on top of that, six hours of deposition and six hours of court testimony. And so, and uh, so I, I want to talk about it in here. Is it, this is a, if you look at this map in front of you, it's a file map, what we call file maps in the county of Kern. And the county went in and did a, uh, they, they did a perpetuation map is what they call it. And this is the, the area in question is right down here. You'll see this in the Southwest corner or of section nine and keep it. We're gonna identify this now as two different uh, section corners. Hathaway was a surveyor for the county in the 1940s. He set this pipe. In 19, and we're going to talk a little bit about this monument down here. The other monument, so there's discrepancies, two, two monuments for the same section corner. And if you look, uh, the other one is this one we're going to call it's McMurdo Corner. And you'll see a 110 foot difference between them. And this is what the original government note said. It said they set a charred post in a mound with trenches and pits as per instructions for the corner standard, which you, you'll see on most of the uh, field notes. Then it, there's a, a miss what this number down here is a miscellaneous map in the county of Kern. And this is a miscellaneous map set uh, done by uh, 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 McMurdo back in 18, 1895. Now, 1960, 1862, the original corner is set. So 30 some years later, McMurdo comes in and uh, enlargement of the southeast of eight, which is the southwest of nine. You'll see it says three by three river stake painted white mark for section corner, basically. Now, he does not note, he does not say found and replaced. So this becomes an issue in the trial, a possible issue. Then in 1936, a guy by the name of Myers, he was a PG&E surveyor. He comes in and he finds McMurdo's stake and he sets his own pipe. He, he doesn't, in a subsequent survey he did, he says, I found a three by three by McMurdo and he's going to assemble there is for a set, set, set in an iron pipe. So he finds McMurdo, sets it, sets his pipe. County though comes in in the 40s, 30s and 40s right after Myers worked in there and said did their own perpetuation or their own perpetuation of the entire township. Now you'll see uh, it's so 32 sections. It's, there's a rancho in here but it affects 32 di different sections here. We zoom in on the section eight and nine up here. Right up here we'll see what they they show. They said, well, this little symbol right here is McMur or Myers pipe, which was McMurdo's position. Here you have a double, the county said you should have double propped it. So that thus um, Hathaway sends his quarter in this position at the inner at the uh, at the double propping. So for never a 
number of years uh, these things take place of which corner is supposed to be to fast forward now to the to the twenties. Um, I get a call from um, I'm going to go back here. I get a call from an attorney and said, "We I need you to analyze this. I need you to look at this corner. Which one's the true one?" And and he shows me the file map. Well, what started was is that um, is um, in the everybody's been kind of let me go back to the county let's go back to the county's map okay everybody all surveys down in this area here we're using this as their proportioning all to, everything to the south the rest of the township nobody's really using hathaway until for some reason uh, surveyor uses this as the lot line adjustment says this is the corner you should be using down lower here down in a couple of uh, down to the southwest corner of the section or down by the quarter corner um, another surveyor uh, was hired to do a survey of the of their property he cites the lot line adjustment says i need to use this corner because that's the newest one that's the newest record information. I need to use that. Therefore, farmer, you need to take out three rows of your vineyard. Well, that farmer said, okay, uh, but what do I do? And the surveyor says, well, go to the guy to the north. <laughs> well, that's my client now. My, uh, that neighbor sues my client for not only the three acres of this long triangle and says, I own this land. And keep in mind, there is a road herring road runs right through here right to the sec the, from the from the mcmurdo monument and up uh the edison highway goes along the using the mcmurdo as their center line so they sue them for the three acres not only that there's a well sitting over here in the easterly portion that, that my client's been using for 80 years they sued for the water that they were using so we're talking a ton of money it's not only the amount of uh, the land that they want, but they want the water usage that they encroached. So we'll go go back and yeah, see where am I? Okay. So I get called in and I said, okay, I start doing some uh, start researching this thing, and I come up to the 19th. I look at this when they analyzed it. We're at 19 in the 30s when you had Myers decide what corner to use, uh, it was in the 30s and then county was disputing in the 40s. So I went to the 1930 manual and it, it came out, the expert testimony of surveyors who may have identified the original monument prior to the destruction and thereupon recorded new accessories or connection is by far the most reliable, though landowners are often able to furnish valuable testimony. So I took that to the courtroom and said, well, the expert in this case, the one that saw it is the surveyor, which would have been McMurdo. So McMurdo, even though his map, I'll try to go back here. It's a little awkward, but I'll go back to McMurdo's corner right here, the three by three red stake. He does not say he found and set. The plaintiff's expert was saying he did not say found and replaced. Well, we contended is that you got to judge the, the the nature at the time of what they did at the time they did it. We cannot, we have, we tend to judge by today's standards what they should have done back in the 19, in, in 1893 or whatever, in 1892. We judge, we judge their methods by today's standards. And that was the fallacy and the argument that we contend it says, no, what happened is what we we were able to show McMurdo and several other surveyors at the time when they went and found a monument. And in fact, in the 1891 man, 1881 manual, it says to replace it. So we it, were able to we contended that McMurdo found the original and set his own. And and he didn't have to put down found and replace because at that time that's just what you did there was no 
uh, no uh, statute or anything that says, well, you got to put or a county surveyor saying you got to say found and replaced. Now, don't get me wrong. I think he should today is say found and replaced. But we were able to contend that that's not what happened at that time. So I gave an analysis and I won't go through all of this, but we I gave an analysis to the judge and said, OK, it's uh, it's. The first one is a surveyor. The last known witness was Thompson's monument. He qualifies as the most reliable source under section 355 of the 1930 manual. And there's some other stuff that happened and there's all kinds of other evidence that's pointing that by, right, by usage and other things that showed that McMurdo's was correct, that we should use it. Um, and then, it, we were showing and working with the, the county and the county even later after the 1940s into 70s, they started saying, yeah, there's a, we, we think it's McMurdo's, but didn't come out and say it, but they were able to say it. So if the, the last is we, if we accept Hathaway, then we're gonna throw the whole township in disarray. Now, if you accept Hathaway, now all the other monuments that Myers had set, we got to throw those out, which everybody's been accepting. And so we were going at that approach as well. Then, so the ruling came out and this is the judge's ruling and this uh, quote, uh, the courts conclude that McMurdo did find and replace the original monument set by Thompson in 1862. This conclusion is based upon McMurdo's 1895 survey map depicting the corner of section eight. Testimony of the parties retained experts and the presumption regarding the discharge of duties of public officials. Plaintiffs retained expert witness expressed doubt that McMurdo had actually located the original 1862 monument. His opinion in that regard was based largely on the lack of a specific notation by McMurdo that he had found the original Thompson monument. He testified also, however, that he did not review the provisions of the 1890 manual. So it's important to know get your resources. Uh, by contrast, the defendant retained the expert determined by McMurdo would have required to do so under the guidelines set forth in the 1890 manual survey instructions and the manual effect at the time of McMurdo survey. Defendant expert concluded that McMurdo had located the monument. The conclusion is consistent with presumption that an official duty has been regularly performed and then based on that conclusion, the courts find and declares the section line established based upon Meyer's survey and the center line of Herring is a true position and rules in our favor 100%. So it's the, it is a case, this is where I think a case that several things that, that resources weren't used on what the research going back and, and actually doing your research and using the pedigrees of the my call to pedigree and in this case we were able to get to win it because of um, and, and it wasn't about just winning it's about presenting the evidence and letting the judge decide what what they thought and uh, what what that judge and able to uh, communicate to it but they the the original lines are unalterable and in this case the lot line adjustment triggered in and they started using it saying well that's the latest one so they should use that one so i think it's a it's a, a good case that shows it was it was kind of it was really a neat day so any questions on that nobody okay. Nobody, no questions. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought I'd get some questions on that. Know, how much good. time? How much? How much time do we got there, Trent? I don't yeah. want to go. I, I mean, I got a couple of cases, but I can I can stop them any time. But yeah, no, um, it's we got a, technically another half an hour left. So. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's only um, five It's only five o'clock. So okay. I guess, I, I guess I would chime in that yeah, I mean the the guy I forget which surveyor's name that perpetuated those original redwood stakes i mean he did it right and just because somebody sent a new bright bright shiny one i mean that pedigree led you right to he perpetuated that monument mm -hmm. yeah that's exactly what happened is that he, the, the like i said we tend to judge today's standards why didn't they do that well that's it's not what they did back then it just just was what it is We've, um, had that, we've had that come up quite a few conversations throughout Mentoring Mondays about the standard of care, right? Standard of care today or standard of care in the next 15 years versus where it was 100, 
you know, hundred years ago. So that's a great, great point to bring up there. Well, one of the things they contended too, and I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but it didn't calculate correctly for them because when you did all the lines of intersections, well, you did the double prop, it hit 110 feet off. Well, can't be right, you know, because that, our math isn't coming into play. That damn mathematics. Yeah, and so it was. I go, well, it's, you got to look at it where the original is. And, and people are dependent upon it. If you go with mathematics, you're going to throw 32 square miles out of, out of whack if you do, do the mathematics, if you rely strictly on math. Um, okay, this is another one that's kind of a, it's a rather simple one, but I think it pertains to what we're talking about. I, um, we um, did a survey out south of Bakersfield, and there was a uh, we're surveying, and if you can see my cursor, we're surveying up in this northeast quadrant, this section to the northeast, and we're probably saying like, I think it's like the west half of the southwest corner of this section, and everybody's always used this three-quarter, three-by-four redwood as the section corner. Everything that you go to, the county called it a section corner, put it in a, in a lamp hole or a monument casement, and we did a survey, and we found a couple of uh, unrecorded iron pipes in the position where we would put it. So we, we accepted it. And then we got a call from the neighbor to the east and said, you're wrong. You used, my surveyor says you used the wrong corner. So to be diligent, I said, oh, oh, yeah, there's another one out here, but that's not the section corner. Let me research it and see what's going on. And um, just to make sure, and what we found is it was th that corner back here, you'll see was set by KCLLC, KCLC, which is Kern County Land Company. And um, they would go and set, uh, they, they owned a lot of land. If you're familiar with the Miller Lux and Kern County Land Company lawsuit about water, I mean, landmark case, if you wanna look at landmark case of, of uh, 1893 or something about water rights, getting water to go across the canal, uh, getting water from a canal that's over another property. Um, it, it's above my pay grade to interpret it, but it was a landmark case to use. Well, anyway, K K uh, both Kern County Land Company and, and there's another one, Miller Lux would use what they call sales maps. And they, they would go start off at a section corner and just go 2640 by 2640. They didn't care about quarter corners. They owned the whole section and they would just do it. That's how they did it back in the back in that time period. So you're always aware in this area that if you see a KCLC monument or, or that or a sales map corner, that it might not be the quarter corner or it might not be the section corner. Well, fortunately, the county got most, I think they've got most of the case, uh, Kern County Land Company field notes. So we went to the, uh, pulled up the field notes and found, uh, and this is kind of hard to read, but he, if you look up here, it's the southwest corner, found a pipe, then they quarter, uh, they went to the section corner, a quarter corner, and then they just pulled 2640. As you look down here in the bottom right, they found the corner here. This is a better way to put it than just the notes, but look down here, it says they found, they just said 2640, 2640. And then they here it says found a nail and shiner. And they replaced it and put a concrete monument in it. So we, so what I came with my notes, I filed a record of survey like I'm supposed to do. You see lot 25 and 26 of the, uh, of the current KCL, the land map, the sales map. Um, and so it, we did our record of survey to show where, and then we did a little detail down there in the corner, you'll see. But then I came with a narrative and the narrative is the reasoning that we rejected it. And we said we had rejected it basically is they found a nail and shiner and there's no evidence to it. It's 5280 from the Southwest corner. And we said, that's not the true section corner. Now it can pertain to my to the subdivision of the sales maps to the west and the other section to the west but we couldn't go past the section line so we used it for the subdivision we, uh, uh, in our section so it was to the how they subdivided it to the west and we accepted that as the position we should be using as far as the subdivision goes anyway that was kind of a simple one that we anyway we were able to 
figure out until this is what we got. So any questions on that one? The best part is the map was defendable when it was recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At least is my interpretation of what yeah. I thought it was. And of put course. it down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but at least okay. it's there. At least it's yeah, it's there. it. Um, the only comment I'd have, and I put it in the notes, is that you know, really excellent doing the narrative. You know, explain why you rejected it. Mm -hmm. So many times, people, you don't know if they missed it or you know mm -hmm. what their reasoning was. I mean tell tell your story and your survey record Very right good. yeah i think narratives are important i think california is looking into making it mandatory i think there's been talk about it but there's been pushback so um we'll see i think they're they they are important to, to put place whether you stand on mandatory or not i'm going to leave that for another debate <laughs> yeah. um this is uh, one I'm working on right now. I am still kind of uh, uh, kind of um, waffling a little bit. I mean, not waffling, but I'm trying to decide what I want to do. What we found was um, we're doing some uh, work in, you know, out in the west in the Carisal Plains, I guess you would call it. And we found what we think is the original corner that was set like this this one here northwest of five and these are track corners of course or lot 72 the track i think i put lot 72 i think that's track 72 um but this is the northwest corner of section five this is a read a uh dependent or yeah i think it was a dependent i can't remember if it's dependent or independent survey up here and this one was the northwest corner of five we found the in a, a glo corner with brass cap undisturbed but this distance here of 3930 the actual i think it comes out what is that 60 links or so well but the plat says and the notes both say 1.91 chains but there is no check from here around the you know there's no check from this point they just drop it and go so there's no from the from this northwest corner to the next one. You have no call, and that's it. It's just drop it, and they move on. So, but I'm getting this thing is not disturbed. Fences are occupying it, and so I'm saying there was another survey that was done. They said, well, this is grossly out of position. It's got to be over here, and I'll go to my little narrative, and I said. Uh, of course, we always have to do these in California uh, or pursuant. And then it says, it's even though the distance is grossly different on the record of survey that we look on the plot too, this monument was accepted as original position because there's no indication that the monument has been tampered. In addition, the lines of occupation fences seem to indicate they relied upon this monument. The position for the Northwest corner per the record of sur survey, per that record survey is saying it's another 1.9 chains away is suspect to the true position in that it trusts in finding roots of possible bearing tree and relies on distance instead of relying on the found position of the monument. So I could, at this point, I can't, I, I look over and there's possible bearing tree. <laughs> I, I, I could not hang my hat on that one. So I'm right now I'm in the middle of, of really, I think I'm going to end up accepting where we found it and that's just what it is and uh and so uh but welcome to any suggestions on that one too but anyway so um that's really what i had today uh, you have any questions on that one uh armin armin just put his hand up oh. just a question uh, any topo calls to check to Good question. Yeah, we looked at that. Not really. I mean, it was there was uh, I think there was a wash that went through there, but it's it's not really determined. And but it was it, um, it. But that was it. It was not like but even then it was like a drop by. And so it wasn't there was no tie back to that section corner. And it just kind of just there it was. And they put it in and you know, I wish there was something else that we could contend, say, well, had a little more proof to it, but that was it. Not much. George, you're typing away. You bet you can unmute yourself if you want. Or talk there. 
<laughs> there you go. Okay, I, I'm I'm just saying most of us that are older have been through enough of these scenarios that we realize that you've got to look everywhere, you've got to dig everywhere, uh, you can't take anything for granted. And if you don't look at the evidence along the lines, mm -hmm. uh, monuments, records, uh, you're going to miss out and you're going to end up walking on yourself somehow along the line and you're going to be sorry for it later on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, it's just, that's why we all drink, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so you're buying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll be buying up here, Trent, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, well, I heard, I heard Trent just got a boatload of uh, whiskey in or something. Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting on, an, I'm waiting on another barrel too. Should be yeah. <laughs> Tell me when and where I'll be there. No, you're gold. I mean, yeah. if it's, if it's undisturbed and there's, and the ground's not disturbed, and you've got it and there's no conflicting bearing trees that 110 feet away if possible i mean i i go to court all day long with what you're doing there yeah that's that's thanks mike I, that's what i'm leaning on is that I, I cannot go off of a possible bearing tree i just i just it's not good enough for me it just i, I don't you know what what is a possible I, I i know i i think it's a type of uh wood or something possible or something i don't know <laughs> you know I, I gotta say i was extremely lucky in my career i got to work with a gentleman named steve Parrish. yeah and for a number of years and and uh i learned so much from him uh and i've got to say one of the best days uh, I ever spent in the field that was with Steve. We went out and found five corners. We were looking for five. We found five, uh, two different townships. Uh, it was a, it was a wonderful day. That was probably one of the most successful days of, of my surveying career. Uh, then we sent the crew out to tie them all, but uh, good stuff. And I'll see you at the end of this month, Trent. I'll be expecting at least I don't drink whiskey, but my wife will help you with that. <laughs> all right. That's perfect. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll put in the uh, in the chat. Do you have an example of a situation where occupation overpowered case law and boundary surveying rules? Occupation. Occupation overpowered case law. I'm trying to think. Um, I, I'm not. Nothing's coming to mind for me. If anybody else has something, I'm not coming up with where where lines of occupation, unless it's some sort of unwritten title or something where they've occupied it for years and years, and the courts go in and rule that um, you, because you've been using it for California's five years, and the judge says, "Yep, you got it," even though the lines over here they may right of use or something maybe adverse or whatever that's the only thing i'm thinking possibly you know the courts can always <laughs> of course they're not always dependable you know so they could they could switch on you real quick yeah that's kind of what i was what i was getting at it's just kind of the area that you're in and the court i mean <clears throat> first time i went to court i was blown away by just how you know inexperienced most of the people were with it and you know how you know heavily they relied upon everything that we say because i mean even my lawyer that i was representing she said you know the only one in this courtroom that knows less about surveying uh than me is the judge yep <laughs> yeah yeah i had no idea so well, yeah. I I found in my court, and I think I'm doing a one on ex, my experience and expert testimony. But uh, the, what I find when I do go in is you got to explain it. You gotta you have to be very clear of what you're explaining, and because they they rely upon you. There's some great books out there on it, but yeah. Awesome. Thank go you. Part, yeah, I guess the only one that I can think of like that was back to this moved monument. And so the, somebody had moved it. And I think it was an IBLA case. My memory's not what it used to be. Um, but it was a government monument. And then a whole bunch of people started relying on it as landowners. 
and you can't fault them, right? They didn't know, they didn't know this diligence and this scrutiny of, of mathematics and everything else. And they said, well, it's, it's an acquiescence thing that everybody relied, it, it looked like, it looked, talked and spoke, it was actual physical government monument, but it had been moved. And so kind of overruled everything. It's like, are we gonna, are we gonna ruin this whole house of cards of all this occupation? They, they did, they said, this is a government monument as far as the physical pipe, but it had been moved. But um, that ruling was where we have harmony. So, so why mess with harmony? And uh, I'll have to pull that up. Sometime at two o'clock in the morning, I'll remember the case. Yeah. <laughs> call, call Trent. <laughs> I'll, I'll call Trent and ask him how his whiskey barrels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, I think I sold Trent out, but yeah, it, okay. it, you, you, it's difficult to know what the court's going to say. And yeah, and, and what I have found is that they're reluctant to move to to take a line of occupation. You know, they're reluctant to dis disrupt harmony. Uh, that's what I've seen anyway. So, and, you know, sometimes that monument gets put in there and it gets memorialized after a while and, you know, people start depending upon it. It was, uh, you know, I, I had a, uh, a project that I'm working on and they, they swore, they, they, fortunately it's in a trust and it's an LLC and everybody's kind of ran all together. And they all said that that pipe there that they showed to me is the section corner. <laughs> and I, I have no evidence towards it at all, but we're gonna do a descriptions based upon that pipe when we move the lot line. So, uh, you know, it's, we're trying our best and not knowing where the section line is, it's gonna be an eight, 1870s, is when it was surveyed, so we're doing the best we can to go. Okay, we're going to use this pipe, but it's all this area here in the section, and and fortunately we can move it around a bit. So, but yeah, hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I mean, unfortunately, we have that. We have to kind of make that judgment call to not disturb, you know, the peace because even though our records and everything that that we're finding that's original is telling us that that you know. That corner is under underneath the driveway of the lady that called me to tell me that her neighbor is encroaching. And now you're about to tell her that, yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure there's an original monument under your driveway. So, but, you know, do, you, do I, we kind of let sleeping dogs lie here or do we, you know, I mean, and, and it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you kind of, kind of have to read, you have to read every situation. It depends on the neighborhood you're in the you know the pedigree like you're saying the pedigree of the monuments that you're finding and the history and i mean it's it's a, definitely an art <laughs> well i think i think uh, you know that the, the court case i was involved with would not have gone where it did had the surveyor saw i'm going to remove three grape, grape vineyards I, I mean i don't know about you all but uh, me i'm going to send and go I'm going to tell the guy to move three grape vineyards. You know, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to do that, you know, to get disrupt that. So I think yeah. it's important you see something that's not matching, you, you double check it, you know. Will, did you post pictures on that on social media? Pro probably, yeah. yeah. I, I think another one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. She, yeah. She asked me, how much does it cost for you to leave right now? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy <laughs> that's awesome yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. anybody got uh any more specific questions they want to talk about we uh uh actually is it next week yeah it is next week um we're doing a fall seminar in nevada um on some case studies similar to this kind of stuff we're on as well which makes this kind of stuff makes such great round tables it's uh it's fun to talk about so I love it. But anybody got any questions they want to talk about? If not, we'll, uh, it's dinner time for us on the West Coast. So Ron's got dinner to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, uh, okay. well, th yeah. Well, thanks for letting me share with everybody. And, and some of thanks. it was therapeutic. Some of it was uh, venting, you know. <laughs> so, right. Thanks for letting me share with you. And if you have any questions, I'm here in Bakersfield. So 
and let me know. Awesome. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Have a good, have a good week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys.